Kelvin Hepner for Real Agriculture at Crop Connect in Winnipeg and joined by Tom Wolf of Agrometrics and Sprayers 101. Tom, when it comes to drone spraying in Canada, where are we at in terms of the, the policy environment around uh, the legality and allowing of drones to be used for herbicide application in crop? Uh, as far as today, February uh, 2025, there are still no agricultural pesticides registered for drone use in Canada. We have had in the fall a, a registration of uh, triclopyr, which is a, a uh, herbicide made by Corteva for the removal of woody perennials in rangeland and pastures and rights of way, and that has received a drone label but there are no other agricultural uses other than fungi, uh, sorry, uh, fertilizers and, um, and seed. Okay. Yeah. Are there any uses in terms of insecticides? I know there's some application there when it comes to mosquitoes potentially, that type of thing. That's right, for not, possibly not for, agricultural. Yeah. Yeah, for municipalities perhaps it might be, but they, uh, there are BT products that would be larvicides for mosquito control. Okay. So do you see, what do you see as the, the next phase in terms of moving this ahead if, if drone spraying is to be allowed in Canada? What, what will that take? Well, the PMRA is currently basically responding to registrants' requests to put a drone use on their label, and then in return, the PMRA would request a few data sets from these registrants. They would include drift data, they would include efficacy data, does it work as well as, what, are the, what would the rate structure be? It would be uh, operator bystander exposure data, is there a risk? And also MRLs, maximum residue limits. Does the low water volume and the small droplet size used by drones affect how herbicides or other pesticides are retained by the by the, the food crop? And is that going to impact our export markets? Okay. So those label, that process is underway in terms of the applicants working on, on having those label changes made. Are they running into issues there or, or where, where is the holdup in terms of is this potentially something that we can expect on the horizon in the near future or is this more of a longer term thing? The holdup is really that it's driven by the registrant's desire to have their product on a label, and they're not really lining up uh, to have to take those steps. And it's also a bit of a long process, so they do have to prepare all the data that I just outlined, probably many other data points that I'm not aware of, and they have to make a submission to the PMRA, and the PMRA takes 16 months to approve a submission like that. So, for example, there was a submission for an agricultural fungicide made this fall, and it will be 16 months, it will be 2026 before we see that product uh, available in Canada. Um, there will be probably other products like Garlon XRT, that is triclopyr by Corteva, that may follow suit for that same market, the non-agricultural market, but a very useful market for you know rights away, like hydro rights away in the far north, that kind of a thing. What do we know about drone application in terms of the understanding of how the droplets disperse in the field and, and that type of thing. That research, of course, there's. I'm assuming there's been a ton of research happening around that the last number of years. Am I, am I assuming wrong? There's an increasing body of work that uh, documents, you know, what kind of quality job a drone can do. Certainly, there's all kinds of anecdotal reports from users of drones and sellers of drones that they work equivalently, and we don't have a lot of data to prove that they don't. But we, what we have got is a lot of patternation data. So the problem with, I guess not the problem, but the issue, I guess, with any aerial application is that you don't really know what your swath width is because it's not driven by a boom width. So a 120-foot boom is going to lay down a 120-foot swath. A drone or an aircraft of any sort relies on redistribution of the spray emits from a boom or a single atomizer, or rotary set of rotary atomizers, and it distributes itself in the downwash, and it widens out to certain degrees. And how far it widens out depends on a lot of factors, like flying height, flying speed, droplet size, water volume, canopy structure, wind conditions. All of those affect the swath width and its uniformity. And so it's a little bit more difficult to just simply say, yeah, that's the swath width, or you're good to go. You do have to do a lot of testing. And the downside of not doing the testing is really that you might have striping in your field. So are we gaining an understanding there? Is that learning happening right now in the field? 
It's happening. So we're certainly doing some of it in our company. Um, and uh, we're working, obviously, with my partner, Jason DeVoe, in, in, in acquiring some data. And there's other partners doing it. I know that Corteva, in pursuing some of their industrial reg registrations, are doing similar work. And so we are learning a lot. Uh, what we're finding is that the swath width is, in fact, as variable as we suspect it is. Um, it's not really a straight line down the field. If you fly straight, your edge of the, your swath isn't exactly as straight because little gusts of wind can displace it so easily. I find that to be a bit, a bit of a problem. We also see a kind of a lack of uniformity. Like we're finding that there are some really high peaks and really low valleys in this distribution, unlike, I mean, it's not completely unlike other application methods, but it's a little worse, I would say, than the other application methods. And so we have to figure out, is that acceptable? How can we mitigate that? And you know, you asked the question, what are we doing on the development of maybe new drone technologies? I think we're actually at the beginning of this whole story. Still in the early stages of developing that. Yeah, we've really got a situation where drones were you know, deployed in, in Asia primarily to relieve people walking through rice paddies with knapsack sprayers. Most pesticides that are allowed to be used with knapsack sprayers in Asia are immediately allowed to be used by drone. What they're trying to do is get people out of these situations where they have high exposure, high risk to the individual. The drone for them is a big improvement. So those are the drones that we're seeing in North America. And they are, they're showing to be, as I said, a little bit less, than, less uniform than we would like them to be. So I see uh, the need for continued evolution in the design of the drones. The concept is sound. But I would say it's a little too early to, to you know, uh, be too enthusiastic about them because, yeah, it's a little bit uh, less than ideal. Final question on this topic then, Tom. It's kind of hard to have a conversation these days without getting into geopolitics. And we have a lot of these drones, as you mentioned, coming from Asia, from China specifically. Do you see potential geopolitical uh, factors slowing down the adoption or advancement of drone spray application in North America on the horizon if, say, the U.S. administration bans drones from, from China? Yeah, and as we know, there is a bill in front of the House that, uh, or Congress, I guess, the House has already passed it, but the Senate has not yet passed that bill, as far as I know, that would severely constrain the import of Chinese-made drones. And it's possible that that would also be a constraint to Canada because, you know, when we, when we you know, put a tariff on electric cars from China or, you know, we did that a week after America did that. So we, we followed in, in lockstep. There are some new companies that are using, I guess, Western or NATO or OECD supply lines that would not be affected by a ban from China specifically. But we've also seen, you know, with any kind of restriction on imports, we've seen people be able to sidestep that and just put their supply chain into other offshore places that make a similar product that are not affected. And so we'd have to chase that. Hard to predict that, actually. Okay. I guess just in the, at least in the short term, the cost, there could potentially be a cost factor that would slow down purchases potentially. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, but, you know, the drones are remarkably affordable. You know, and on a you know, if, like say, let's say a T50, a DJI T50 can do 20 to 30 acres per hour, and you can buy them for less than forty thousand dollars. That's a tremendous amount of acres per purchase dollar compared to say a ground sprayer, which costs probably ten times or more as much for this equivalent uh, capability. So there is a. Uh, there is actually some room to move. They, they could be more expensive and they probably wouldn't hurt their sales that much. Yeah. That is, I think, yeah, that's of course what's driving a lot of the excitement about the potential for drones as, as an application uh, model or system. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of people say, you know what, I'm going to try these. Um, compared to my ground spare, they're relatively affordable. Uh, and if they don't work out, I haven't, you know, sunk a whole lot of money into it and I'm going to do a lot of learning and maybe I can sell them to someone else after, so I'm not that committed to it. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of exploring going on right now. And of course, the unfortunate thing is, it's all kind of done under the radar, right? I mean, it's, it's a, it is still illegal to spray agricultural pesticides by drone, and because it's illegal, then there's also a reluctance to be licensed to, be, to fly that drone and to register your drone with Transport Canada or to get the SFOC required to you know, apply pesticides because that would expose you. And that basically means we might be you know, playing with fire a little bit on the risk side. 
you know, are we are qualified pilots flying these heavy drones? Are they flying them in uh, in a safe manner? Are they sharing airspace with an aircraft, an agricultural aircraft, during spraying season? Very likely. I'm a little bit worried about the safety of all that, to be honest. And so far, at least publicly, I don't know whether we've had incidences that are, are publicly known, but like you're saying, there's potential for some risk like that. Yeah, there is. I mean, there was one big one that happened last month in, in California with a camera drone hitting the wing of a, of a, of a water bar from Quebec. And luckily, that was a small drone, probably, you know, one of those little camera drones. These drones are 100 kilos, and they're going to get bigger. They're not going to get smaller. And so they, they are a very serious object, not just in the air, but also on the ground spinning their rotors. Well, we'll continue following where this goes. Thanks for your time today, Tom. Thank you.